Members of the jury, do you find Gay News Limited guilty or not guilty of blasphemous libel? Guilty. On the same charge, do you find Dennis Lemon guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Dennis Lemon, you stand convicted of crime. Have you anything to say before the court passes judgment upon you according to law? No, I do not at this time. Lemon, it is perhaps being a little too optimistic in this era of obscenity, but it is possible to hope that by this verdict, the pendulum of public opinion is beginning to swing back to a more healthy climate. I have no doubt whatever, and apparently 10 of the jury agree with me, that this poem is quite appalling. The first and trial for blasphemy for 56 years held this summer in London. It seemed to many an eccentric event, but it raised a vital question. Can any belief still be held so sacred that it should be protected by law? Can come to express in those words a conversion to Christ, if so be the poem means that. As for its publication, at the lowest, it reveals an astonishing and lamentable bad taste. Mary Whitehouse, who began the prosecution. Most mornings before breakfast, her regime includes Bible reading and half an hour's gardening. Her office is a back room in her home in Colchester. From it, she runs the National Viewers and Listeners Association, which she founded 13 years ago, to coordinate the fight against obscenity in the media. Thanks very much indeed. Are they sugared? No. Oh, oh right. Yeah. Oh, what size? Half inch? Uh, yes, that would, do, that would do fine. Her correspondence is extensive, her energies unflagging. Does she spend her days here, coiled up on the lookout for improprieties? No. <laughs> we, we don't have, I mean, the, not only me, but I think most people in the country don't have to keep a lookout. I mean, it positively hits you everywhere you turn. One place where Mary Whitehouse turned was here, Fulham, London, the offices of Gay News. But I don't want him to use number, is it four? Four's OK, I think. Dennis Lemon, editor of Gay News, defendant at the trial for blasphemy. That's dreary. Yeah. That's number five. Okay. Okay. Fine. Thanks. And if you do that this morning for me, because uh, okay. this is anything out. Fine. Thanks. Okay. Five years ago, Dennis Lemon was one of the founders of Gay News. Since then, the papers built up a circulation of some twenty thousand, providing a forum for news and comment about the homosexual world. Hi, JC. Hi. We're starting on this page. Yeah? Can you get the, the poem, which was the subject of a prosecution for blasphemy? was sent to him by a previous contributor to Gay News. How did he react to it when he first saw it? I thought it was a powerful poem, and I thought that the message it contained was a powerful enough message to take people back, but not in the, uh, not in the sense that Mrs Whitehouse was taken aback by it. It was published in Gay News issue 96 in June last year. As both poem and illustration have been found blasphemous in a court of law, we are not free to show them. They describe sexual acts between the centurion at the crucifixion and the dead body of Christ. It will become evident, as the programme develops, what those acts are and what possible interpretations can be put on the poem. The author of the poem was James Kirkup, a professor of literature who lives in Japan. He has published several volumes of verse. He was not on trial. It was the publication that offended. In Gay News, the reaction was immediate. Twenty letters were printed, thirteen condemning the poem. It's very difficult not to publish something which doesn't shock someone at some point. One, one can't op operate a newspaper without bearing that in mind. Um, but I never thought it would result in the uh, court action. I read that. I don't recollect that there was anybody in the office. I think I possibly opened my pre post before anybody came in. I was entirely alone when I saw that and read it. And I just felt in my heart, I could not let that happen. I could, I don't mean I, I wanted to stop that thing being printed, it was being printed. But the challenge to me was this. If I did nothing about that, I was then part and identified myself with the people who turned their back on Christ, who didn't want to know Christ, 
at the time of his crucifixion. And I knew I had to do something. I couldn't have lived with myself again if I hadn't. What is the poem about? Could you describe it? Well, basically, it's a, about a 60-line poem. It's got 11 stanzas in it. And it's the poet has created a character, the centurion, who was at Calvary, who is at the crucifixion of Christ and stays with the body um, during the three days before Christ uh, is resurrected. Um, and it's basically the fantasy that is running through the mind of the centurion whilst he's alone with the dead body of Christ. What is it about? Well, the poem is really about Christ. First of all, it presents him as a promiscuous homosexual. And then it, it goes on to describe what, certainly in my terms, and I think in many people's terms, are perverted homosexual practices on the dead body of Christ. If you it read the poem in a purely literal sense, then I think you miss totally what, what the message of the poem and the power of the poem. I do find it extraordinarily difficult to interpret what is written in that poem in the crudest possible manner and turn that into something which is supposed to be beautiful. The centurion represents a repressed homosexual, a Christian who is guilt-ridden and cannot reconcile his Christianity with his homosexuality. Um, and that's basically what the poem's about. Um, in the end, particularly in the final two stanzas of the poem, the centurion finds salvation. He goes, comes to God. He recognises God's love and uh, finds salvation. I decided that I would talk to my solicitor about this. Uh, and um, this was, as I say, the, the result of my feeling that I, I had to do something. And it was only as I talked it over with my solicitor and with counsel that together we felt that there was indeed grounds here for action. Um, as uh, counsel said, if this isn't blasphemous, nothing ever would be. So the prosecution was lodged. In December 76, Mary Whitehouse solicitors applied to a judge in chambers, Mr Justice Bristow, for leave to bring the case to court. He gave it. The trial was set for the Old Bailey. 4th of July, 1977. The case was to begin at 10.30 a.m. Early that morning, Dennis Lemon arrived to stand his trial. And he wasn't alone. Well, I've come to see a beautiful medieval miracle play. I'm here to protest and to see what other gay people are doing. Um, I come along because I'm gay and a Christian, and I'm, I find the whole trial for blasphemy and of this particular poem very worrying on, on both counts, I think. We come along basically because we see this as a political trial. Primarily to find out a little bit more about uh, what the sort of Gay Liberation Fund are trying to sort of prove, but also to, uh, to see Mrs Whitehouse win, actually. The people outside the courtroom were those actually involved in the case, but as we were not allowed to take our cameras inside the Old Bailey, this courtroom is a reconstruction, and all the people in it are actors. The main characters, John Smythe, counsel for the prosecution. Dennis Lemon, with Geoffrey Robertson defending the company Gay News Limited. and John Mortimer QC defending the editor, Dennis Lemon. Thank you, Michael. At 10.25, the public were allowed into the gallery. Many of them had been queuing for over two hours. Most were supporters of gay news. Mr. Lemon. 
This is a reconstruction, and obviously we've had to condense the proceedings, but every word that you will hear spoken was spoken just ten weeks ago at the Old Bailey. Be upstanding. All persons who have anything to do before my lords, the Queen's Justices of the Central Criminal Court, draw near and give your attendance. God save the Queen. The judge, His Honour Alan King Hamilton, QC. Stand up. <clears throat> Dennis Lemon, is that your name? Yes, it is. Uh, before yes. the indictment is put in this case, my lord, I have a motion to quash it. Yes. Your lordship has perhaps seen the indictment. It alleges that Gay News Limited and Dennis Lemon between the 1st day of May and the 30th day of June 1976 unlawfully and wickedly published or caused to be published in a newspaper called Gay News Number 96 a blasphemous libel concerning the Christian religion namely an obscene poem and illustration vilifying Christ in his life and crucifixion. Uh, my submission in opening to your lordship is this, that the law of blasphemy has changed in a changing society, that Christianity is no longer part of the law of England, that the court can no longer decide the religious questions connected with this charge, and that a law which only protects one religion in a multi-religious society can no longer be part of the law of England. In order to make this submission, I could perhaps direct your lordship to some of the authorities on blasphemy. Perhaps I could begin with the case of Ramsey in 1883. I was thinking of the jury for the moment. How long is all this argument going to last? Till lunchtime. Goodness gracious me. I was hoping the case would be over by then. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint your lordship, but it seems we should inquire if this law exists or not. Mr. Smythe, were you aware this was going to be taken? I'm surprised my friend finds it necessary to go into the old cases of blasphemy to take the point of whether the case exists in 1977. My lord, I think there are one or two questions of law that may be additionally raised. The answer to my learned friend's point is that I can only go back to old cases as there's no such thing as a modern case on blasphemy. There is no. Well, there may be. So that one is driven however much one would like to finish the case by lunchtime, too open reluctantly. Uh, Ramsey and Foote is reported in the 1948 Law Times at page 733. I don't know if your Lordship's already read this. I have indeed. Your Lordship will recollect this is a Mr. Foote who published a newspaper called... Far from the case being over by lunchtime, John Mortimer's submission, made in the first minute of the trial, begins an intensive legal argument. Before the question of whether or not the law has been broken can be dealt with, it has first to be established that a law exists. The offence of blasphemous libel is part of the common law, that is, the law handed down by judges from case to case, rather than the law created by parliaments in statutes. To find out what the common law is, lawyers have to refer back to previous judgments, quoting, interpreting, constructing their own arguments, out of the reports of old cases and textbooks. And the secular society, which is on page... There's been no trial for blasphemy for over half a century. The last case was brought when our attitudes to religion were very different from what they are today, so John Mortimer is trying to persuade the judge that the law is obsolete. If he succeeds here, then the trial can't even begin. And if there is one thing clear about this law of blasphemy, my lord, it is that it can only be taken advantage of by the Christian church. Probably by the Anglican Church. Yes, but you said when you began to address me that in this country we now have a multi-religious society. Would you say then that any scurrilous abuse with regard to any of those religions was blasphemy or not? No, it isn't. The only blasphemy is that with regard to the Church of England. So that what one is doing is to administer a law which favours one religion. But does the fact that that one religion is the established church of the country make any difference? No, the court doesn't exist to favour one religious sect. Well, one doesn't know what the figures are, and perhaps we can find out. But one doesn't even know if the vast majority of the people of England are Christian, or Mohammedan, or Jewish, or indifferent. But can there be any doubt about it? Well, I should have thought there was enormous doubt. As to the majority of the population being Christian, including Roman Catholics and every denomination of Christians? But if it means you just write down C of E whenever you have an operation, that might be one thing. 
Uh, that might only be an insurance. <laughs> <laughs> well, I dare say the vast majority of people do that, but whether they accept the main tenets of the Christian religion, I would have thought it was open to enormous doubt. My lord, I don't want to be guilty of any repetition in causing delay for the court, but sitting and standing here as we are in the year of our Lord, 1977, I would submit, having regard to the authorities, it is wrong for the court to be involved in this type of proceeding. My lord, could I briefly support my learned friend, Mr. Mortimer's argument? My lord, in my submission... Geoffrey Roberts. There are two defence counsel, Mortimer defending Dennis Lemon, and Robertson defending Gay News Limited. One has instructions to juries in the 19th century cases whether this is likely to outrage the feelings of the great majority of people. And the assumption in the direction is that the general consensus of opinion is Anglican, is a Christian religious persuasion. Is not the jury the person to make the decision, to decide whether the climate has changed, as you suggest? Well, it's really whether that should be left to a particular jury who may be of atheists, agnostics or Anglicans. No Gallup pollster would be satisfied with a sample of 12. Now, I would submit that the offence of blasphemy has withered away because of the plural nature of society. There is no protection for a man who has no religious beliefs. There is no protection for a Buddhist. It may be that the way to treat all religions fairly is not to say that none of them should be protected, but all of them should be protected by a law of blasphemy. My Lord, this law of blasphemy in the submission of the Crown is something which is necessary for the protection of the rights of the vast majority of ordinary people in this country who sympathise with the ideals of Christianity. They're entitled to have their feelings protected. My learned friend, Mr Mortimer, cited a dictum of Lord Reed. No court of law is competent to determine the truth of religious belief. My Lord, I accept that, certainly. But that is by the way in my submission, because what the jury will be concerned with is the beliefs, right or wrong, of ordinary Christian sympathisers. I'm grateful to counsel for the interesting and helpful arguments which they have addressed to me. But I am bound to say I have come to a clear conclusion that blasphemy is still an offence against the criminal law of this country. The fact that England is now a multi-religious society is, in my judgment, nothing to the point. Because England has been a more than one religious society, certainly since the days of Cromwell. It is a question of degree. And I cannot hold that because no court has yet ruled that any other religion can be protected by the law of blasphemy, that therefore the Christian religion can no longer be so protected. In my judgment, the offence of blasphemous libel today occurs when there is published anything concerning God, Christ, or the Christian religion in terms so scurrilous, abusive, or offensive as to outrage the feelings of any member of or sympathizer with the Christian religion and could tend to lead to a breach of the peace. Were I to hold that blasphemy is no longer an offense, I would be ruling against a great weight of authority. The application to quash the indictment fails. Blasphemy can still be used, you know, in this day and age. It's, it, it, people just wouldn't credit it, would they? It's so medieval blasphemy. The whole idea of blasphemy belongs to a previous age where there was a sort of conformity of belief through society. No, I think it's a complete and absolute farce from beginning to end, except that somebody might get hurt. No, I mean, I, I reject that um, blasphemy is any, any kind of charge which can be brought with any degree of credibility uh, in this day and age anyway. In spite of the reactions of those outside the court, Judge King Hamilton has ruled that the law does exist, and he's defined it. And if to many it's an archaic irrelevance, there are still those who would hold that it is the application on earth of the law of God. In the week of the trial, groups of Christians all over the country met and prayed. Things before us tonight, uh, this trial is going on, not involving the gay news and the publication of this poem, which drags the name of our Lord in the dirt, really, and doesn't say what the Bible says about him, which is that he was the spotless Lamb of God. So I think we, I think this is something that will burden every Christian, so I should imagine it should be a burden of our prayer meeting now. So let's. Turn to the Lord in prayer. Then. 
a group of evangelical Christians in Bristol. Lord, we pray for each person involved in the gay movement in this land. Father, we want you to come into their lives. We want your power to be made known to them, each one, Father. Lord, we know that these dear men have sunk so low because of the work of Satan and sin within the human heart. We do pray that throughout this trial your name will be upheld. And pray, Lord, that thou wilt prosper and bless this trial, that your name may be glorified, and that these men, Lord, may be humbled. Lord, we long that you'd work in their lives, mm. that Father Satan may have no room in their lives. Grant our God and Father that ere they pass out into eternity, these dear men may find the Lord Jesus. Mm. Otherwise, what, a, what an embarrassing situation, Lord, later in eternity to face the Son of God. Certainly, I realised that religious religion was a far more sensitive area than I had first. Well, than I had realised. Um, there's many sensitive areas. Uh, I didn't realise that religion in in our society now uh, would be something that people could get so ex heated about. But religious feelings are really the most are of the essence of people. When you offend against their religious feelings, you offend against. You know, the very deepest thing within a heart and being of a man. And what those religious feelings are in individuals and then within society are what makes that society what it is. It's the whole foundation of its culture, its whole way of life. So that it isn't just a case of offending Mrs. Jones or even Mary Whitehouse, or at all Mary Whitehouse. It is because these things hit at the very foundation of what makes men men and women women and societies what they are. The afternoon of the first day. Poppies of the offending pine. No, we are not selling them. Please take a copy of the offending pine for why the gay news is in court. My attention has been drawn to the fact that this morning there have been people in the street handing out to passers-by a document headed the gay news trial and also copies of a poem. It really is past belief that people can be so stupid as to behave in this irresponsible way. Fortunately, no jurors have yet been sworn, but I am bound to ask the jurors when they come in if they have seen this document. Can we begin? My lord, there is one other matter. The prosecution is brought by, of course, Mrs. Mary Whitehouse, who's a well-known figure. I do not intend to make any imputations about her, but... Uh... Uh, but what? Well, perhaps your lordship would invite members of the jury to consider whether they are members of particular societies. For example, the National Viewers and Listeners Association or the Festival of Light. We're talking almost a foreign language to me. I'm sorry, could I put it this way? Uh, societies which have taken strong views on the matters. Can you give me their names? The National Viewers and Listeners Association, uh, with which Mrs. Whitehouse is connected, and the Festival of Light. What is that? That is an association that has similar objectives. Do you want to say anything, Mr. Mortimer? I would support my learned friend's application. And what do you say, Mr. Spider? I would submit that it's wholly wrong that this sort of thing should be done. It's about as wrong as if I were to rise on behalf of the Crown and ask your Lordship to ask the jurors whether they were homosexuals or whether they subscribed to gay news. Once one starts this sort of thing, it never ends. That is what the Court of Appeal said in frowning on this practice recently. Moreover, the associations which have been mentioned are in no way connected with the instigation of this prosecution. Not at all. Mrs. Whitehouse has instigated this prosecution entirely in her individual capacity. I suppose one might as well say, well, if she's a member of the Conservative Party or the Labour Party, one ought to ask questions about that. I'm grateful. I do not think it would be proper for me to ask questions of that kind. But obviously, I must ask if they have, as I am sure you will all agree, seen this Certainly. Now, can we begin? I think we can, at last. I would suggest, my lord, that the jury are brought in, and then the defendants can be arraigned in their presence. Yes. Jurors for blasphemy trial, assembly in court and swearing, please. Jurors for blasphemy trial. Over 40 potential court, jurors stream into court. George Michael Parsons. The individuals who make up the jury ultimately decide every case. The names you're hearing are false, but the faces and types are as near to the real ones as we could match them. 
As the first 12 names are called by the clerk of the court, defence counsel assists them. Robert John Wilson, Betty Rose Kelly, Carol Hill, Gay News Limited and Dennis Lemon. You are both charged... Before the jury are sworn, the indictment is read out. ...and in his crucifixion. Dennis Lemon, are you guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. George Michael Parsons, will you stand up to be sworn, please? And hold the testament in your right hand. Challenge. Can we return to the back of the court? Each counsel has the right to object to seven jurors without giving reasons. This way, please, sir. Challenge. Will you kindly return to the back? So the defence counsel had 14 challenges, and they used them all. This way, please, sir. Hold the testament in your right hand, the card in your left. Repeat the words on the card, please. I swear by Almighty God that I will faithfully try the separate... Thank you, sir. Please sit down. Norman Snow, will you stand up to be sworn, please? And hold the testament in your right hand, the card in your left. and Repeat the words on the card, please. Thank you, sir. Please sit down. Jane Fisher, will you stand up to be sworn, please? Will you hold the testament in your right hand. Challenge. Box, this way, madam, will you please return to the back of the court. Samuel Cohen, will you stand up to be sworn, please? Challenge. Will you kindly leave the box, please? Juliet and Easton. Challenge. Will you return to the back of the court, please? Return to the back of the court. Please. This way, please, madam. Your Honour, I have to go to hospital on Thursday. Hospital on Thursday? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm right, you're excused. One more shot. John Hart. Take the testament in your right hand, the card in your left, read the words on the card, please. I swear by Almighty God that I will faithfully try the several issues joined between our Sovereign Lady, the Queen, and the prisoners at the bar, and give true verdicts according to the evidence. Thank you, sir. I think if, if one can object it to uh, potential jurors, um, one, sh one should do so if one wishes to. I felt very sorry for them. Uh, one of these, the men that had been objected to, he came back looking very rueful and wondering what had happened to him. And uh, I sort of leaned forward and whispered to him. I said, don't worry, it's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Members of the jury... The final jury is selected. The defence hope they've guessed right and the prosecution opens the case. Members of the jury, if you leave this building and walk up Fleet Street into the Strand, you will pass on your way, as I'm sure you know, a number of newsstands. On some of them, you will find that you're able to buy, for 25p, a newspaper called Gay News. The one I hold in my hand is the issue of that paper, published in June, number 96. Now, we see from its front page that it boasts the world's largest circulation newspaper for homosexuals. In this issue, in June of last year, it published a poem and illustration in the middle of the newspaper, and you will see it in due course, which are the subject of this prosecution for the offence of blasphemous libel, that is, a blasphemy in writing. Members of the jury, the Crown say, it is a blasphemy which is so vile that it would be hard for even the most perverted imagination to conjure up anything worse. 56 years ago, in 1921, a jury convicted a man called Gott of this same offence. He had written and distributed a pamphlet which, among other things, described Christ as looking like a circus clown as he entered Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, times have changed, and no one would dream of prosecuting on those facts nowadays. Even less would any jury convict. I tell you of that case, however, because until you were sworn to try this case a few moments ago, no jury in our land has had to consider this offence of blasphemy during that period of 56 years. The case of Mr. Gott, however, is of assistance to us today. It suggests that the offence involves two ingredients which have to be proved. The first is some sort of attack on Christianity which undermines the doctrines of Christianity or the Bible. The second is that that attack should have been made in such a way 
as to pass the limits of decent controversy and to outrage the feelings of any sympathizer with Christianity. With that, by way of introduction and with the leave of his lordship, I'm going to ask that you be handed folders which contain a copy of the poem and illustration complained of. I'm afraid it will not make pleasant reading, but I must ask you to read it, taking your own time. What about the first ingredient of the offence? I remind you that in the submission of the Crown, that ingredient is that the publication complained of should attack or undermine some doctrine of the Christian faith. You may say, having looked at this poem, although you've not had time to study it, well, that's obvious. It attacks the person of Christ. I can see that immediately. The Crown say that it's quite obvious that the poem portrays Jesus Christ as a practicing homosexual and utterly promiscuous. If you look at it, you will find, and I think I've added it up correctly, at least 15 identifiable individuals with whom Jesus Christ is alleged to have committed buggery, as well as anonymous groups such as Herod's guards, can you imagine anything more promiscuous? Quite apart, as I say, from the fact that this is homosexual practice. Next, it clearly desecrates, does it not? Misrepresents, twists, whatever you like, the most sacred event in Christianity, the crucifixion. It takes the crucifixion and makes it the scene for an act, not of ordinary buggery, if you can call it that, but buggery with the dead, Necrophilia. Then, members of the jury, it goes on and becomes, does it not, almost too vile for words, even in the dispassionate setting of an old Bailey courtroom. Because we have then, quite explicitly, what I suppose is the fantasy of Jesus Christ buggering the centurion. Members of the jury, there it is. The Crown say that that first ingredient, an attack on the doctrines of Christianity, the person of Christ, is when one takes a moment or two to examine this poem, only too plain for all to see. It is a vile blasphemy. What about the second ingredient of the offence? Does this outrage the ordinary Christian sympathiser? It'll be said, and I suppose it's true, that we are no longer a nation of regular churchgoers, speaking generally. But putting it at its very lowest, do not the vast majority of us, 99.9%, .9%, I wonder, I don't know, but the vast majority, I suspect, admire the ideals of the teachings of Jesus Christ? We know that the Sermon on the Mount has never been surpassed as a standard for day-to-day -day human living. The vast majority of decent people, and that is what we are talking about, know believe that the Christian ideal of the family unit is something all-important. And all of us know, do we not, however much we fail personally, that promiscuity and permissiveness ultimately bring unhappiness. Your task is to ask yourselves, would this poem and illustration outrage the feelings of that sort of person who admires the ideals of Jesus Christ? In the submission of the Crown, no evidence can be called to assist you in answering that question. That question is entirely for you. Well, I felt what I felt many other times during the course of the trial, that we weren't really in a court. It was much more as, as though we were somewhere where the great uh, spiritual truths of uh, Christendom, if you like, were being fought out. And I felt what uh, John Smythe had to say was simple 
and direct and very moving. Well, I wondered who he was talking about. He seemed to be talking about some very evil person who had deliberately gone out of their way to shake the fabric of our society. And it really didn't seem like me. That concludes the case for the Crown. Mr. Robertson? I am sorry to disappoint the jury, but I do have a submission to make to your Lordship about expert testimony. Members of the jury, I do apologise, but I must ask you to withdraw whilst I consider this. Obviously, I cannot allow the discussions to take place in your presence, because if I decide it is not evidence that is proper, you will already have heard it. I'm so sorry, I didn't know this was going to happen. This way, members of the jury. Members of the jury, you may be interested to know that England are four for one against Australia. <laughs> Mr. Mortimer? Uh, my lord, it is agreed between us all, I think, that the offence consists of the scurrilous attack upon the tenets of the Christian faith, therefore containing two elements, A, the scurrility, and B, what is the Christian faith? Now, are the tenets of the Christian faith something the jury must be expected to know without expert assistance? In a case where there's not an obvious attack on the tenets of the Christian faith... Yes, but this poem is an allegation that Christ behaved in certain ways during his lifetime. Since Christianity is based on the life of Christ, doesn't it automatically become an attack on Christianity through the allegations made in the poem? Are those allegations? Do they amount to an attack on the tenets of Christianity? That is the point. Do they? Without some expert assistance, I don't see how the jury can possibly decide that. Is it a vital issue of the Christian faith that Christ was sinless? Because certainly law-breaking was not unknown to his experience. Is it a tenet of the Christian faith that he was divine? There's a great deal of controversy about that at the moment. Is it a tenet of the Christian faith that he was not homosexual? In my submission, these are matters upon which expert theological evidence must be admissible. But one wants to avoid, if one can, the possibility of this trial being shunted off into various sidelines involving maybe differences of opinion between theologians when the main issue is really clear. Well, it may be very clear to your lordship, but it has taken us some time to talk about it. In my submission, it would be virtually asking the jury to perform an impossible task. If they're going to listen to my learned friend preaching a short sermon, and me making a little speculation and reading passages from the Bible, and Mr. Robertson reading from the Bible... I wasn't inviting you all to. <laughs> Mr. Smythe, do you want to say anything? My Lord, it's absolutely obvious in the Crown submission that to say somebody committed buggery with any number of different people during his life is an attack upon him. Of course, my friends are entitled to submit that it's not an attack, and it's the jury's prerogative to decide. If it isn't obvious, nothing an expert will say will make it more obvious. I would submit, therefore, that no expert evidence ought to be called. I'm clearly of the opinion that it would be inappropriate to call an expert on either side. The indictment is extremely clear. The issue, it seems to me, is simple. It does not involve any explanation of any particular tenet of the Christian faith, anything that is not obvious. This jury is a cross-section of the community, and I cannot believe that they are incapable of appreciating the impact of this poem without any expert assistance. Accordingly, the application will be dismissed. Ask the jury to return, please. Although no expert theological evidence was allowed, two witnesses were called by the defence, Bernard Levin and Margaret Drabble. All they could speak about was whether Gay News itself was a responsible newspaper. But originally, Margaret Drabble had agreed to speak on the literary qualities of the poem. Why did she believe that this would have helped the jury? I think that it's quite difficult to read a poem um, correctly. It's difficult even for students of English literature to read a poem correctly, even with help from professors. And I think that it would have helped um, the jury to have gone over the nature of poetry, the contents of the poem, the kind of intentions or possible intentions, because obviously one can't say exactly what the poet intended, the possible intentions of the imagery, why he chose these particular violent images, this particularly aggressive and shocking theme. And I think that it would have um, 
helped the jury to clear their own minds as to what the poem was trying to say. I actually myself think that um, theological evidence would have been um, more important, if not as important, as literary evidence, um, because after all, blasphemy seems to me to be a theological crime. I, I do think that this case um, should perhaps have been an obscenity case instead of a blasphemy case, in which case the literary evidence would certainly have been very relevant, and also the stature of James Kirk up as a poet, the fact that uh, um, his poems are widely read and admired, all this would have been relevant. But um, the judge ruled that it was not relevant, and therefore we weren't allowed to talk about it at all. Dennis Lemon could have been the crucial witness. Why didn't he go into the box? There was no point. There was nothing I could have said. I could have, uh, apart from continuing this debate about the responsibility of gay news, the, the gay news itself, the gay news itself being on trial, I couldn't have given inten uh, um, evidence about intention, as the judge ruled that was inadmissible, in the same way he had said that uh, in the interpretation of uh, the poem by anyone else except the jury was irrelevant. So there wasn't much point. I couldn't have said very much at all, apart from carried on this, this, this other little trial. Well, I think it had made him appear more real, apart from the, just I think he said not guilty, uh, he stood there quietly and everybody talked about him and round him and everything. Uh, I don't know. I don't know why they didn't, whether it was because uh, the defence felt that he would be vulnerable to cross-examination. Uh, that could well be. And I think um, if there had been allowed the matter of intent, then clearly he would have to have been there. But it was all the time you have to come back to what the blasphemy law is. It isn't what he intended. It's whether those 12 people sitting in the jury felt that people would have had their religious feelings offended. Day five of the trial. One man whose religious feelings have been offended waits outside the court. Why did he come here? Because of the fellas at work. I came here because the fellas at work they were talking about Mary Whitehouse and they called all sorts of different names. So I just stood out and I said, now just a minute, Mary Whitehouse is standing up for what she believes in. Mary Wallace believes in the same God and the same Lord that I believe in. So then after I came away, I thought, I wonder if anybody's standing up outside or, or, or with Mary Wallace to show that they're with. The church is not voice an opinion today. We should voice an opinion. So I came here. I, first of all, I went up to CLC. I told him how I felt. They said, well, if you've got a vision, brother, we prayed about it. You don't come out on your own thing. And, that, and then we got a poster ready, and I came and stood here. A little chapel and all around they lifted me up in prayer and I just praise the Lord. Can't you see what you're no, doing? Can't you see what you have blasphemed my Lord Jesus Christ in that court you have. This poem is not about love, notwithstanding the title. It's about buggery from start to finish. But Jesus the trial now focuses on the three Bible final speeches. Knows, As no expert evidence can be called, it's up to the lawyers to sway the jury by argument and by eloquence. First, the prosecution because it's the right of the defence to have the last word. Smythe basically repeats the arguments of his opening address, which the jury have probably forgotten as they heard it five days ago. It is condemned from start to finish in the Bible, homosexual perversion. What is to be my last word to you in this trial? It's simply this. If this is not blasphemy, nothing is. You are being asked to set the standard for the last quarter of this century and perhaps beyond, one way or the other. Because if you decide that this is not blasphemy, that will set the standard by opening the floodgates. Of course, members of the jury, it's an anonymous service you perform. Your names will not appear in the newspapers when you bring in your verdicts. But never mind. The privilege of raising a banner 
against a tiny minority who seek to inflict this sort of thing on the majority of ordinary people and on our children. Do not forget that in this case. That privilege does not belong to us as counsel. It does not belong to the lady who instigated this prosecution. It does not even belong to his lordship. That privilege belongs exclusively to you. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the privilege of representing the newspaper Gay News. The newspaper is charged in this court with a vile and terrible blasphemy. It has been charged with attacking Christianity. It has been charged with doing so in an outrageous way, a way that would make a sympathizer's blood boil and perhaps even endanger the peace. I hope to show you that this poem is nothing of the sort. This is no lavatory limerick. This is a genuine expression of how one man, a soldier, an outcast, an unbeliever, found Christian love and salvation. Mr. Kirkup, I suggest to you in this poem, is trying to communicate a feeling, his feeling, about God. Now, he's doing so not by saying Christ had sex with his apostles, not anything like that. He's doing it by way of analogy. Christ himself, in preaching his message against righteousness and priggishness, brought that message home by poetry. He, perhaps, was one of the greatest poets. He, too, used metaphors and images, parables and fantasies. Listen to this. I am the bread of life. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood hath eternal life. His disciples, when they heard those words, were shocked, as perhaps you were when you first read Mr. Kirkup's poem. But what he was trying to make them understand was the ecstasy of loving. His disciples took him literally. Eat his flesh and drink his blood. Cannibalism. Just as the prosecution takes this poem literally. Necrophilia. Let us consider for a moment the poem itself. It is about the centurion. It begins, as they took him from the cross, I, the centurion, took him in my arms. He sees the crumpled body of Christ. He looks at it. Now, what is his first thought? His first thought is to justify that death. Why have I done this? Now, we know that Christ was condemned to death for blasphemy. We know that there were rumors going round that turned the crowd against him. He himself said, You call me a gluttonous man, a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. Now, the centurion in the passage that the prosecution takes such exception to is repeating that gossip to himself as a justification for what he has done. He repeats one of the slanders about Christ's message. He loved all men. And as he repeats the slander, suddenly, right at the end, the penny drops and he sees the significance of it for him. He loved all men, body, so, and spirit, even me. Those are the two most important words in the poem. If he loved all men, he loved outcasts. He loved strangers, even homosexuals. Then you see in the next stanza the words, with the hope of resurrection. Now that is really what the poet is getting at that homosexuals, any minority group, have the opportunity, have the hope of resurrection. Now, is that vilification? Is that a violent suggestion? It is one that came from Christ's own teaching, didn't it? When he said he came to save sinners, he said that he came for minorities, the people who were outcast. 
So that, ladies and gentlemen, is, I suggest, an interpretation of the poem. Oh, it may be a very unusual image, and of course it is unusual, but is it a vilifying image? Or is it serious? Let us, in these courts, judge those who are dishonest, who are greedy, who are violent. Let us leave the question of sin to God and the Church. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to bring in a verdict of not guilty. I thought, how can the jury resist that? How can they resist it? And for the very first time, I came face to face with the possibility that the case might be lost. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, there's probably no figure worse in the world than a barrister who rises at three o'clock on a hot Friday afternoon to address a jury who has just listened to lengthy but beautiful and moving and able speeches. But if you can bring yourselves to listen for a little while to another one, I would ask you to do so, particularly for this reason. My learned friend, Mr. Smythe, is appearing on behalf of the prosecution and for several supernatural forces who are no doubt interested in this case. My learned friend, Mr. Robertson, is appearing for a company which has no tangible existence. I'm appearing for the human being, Mr. Dennis Lemon, who is unfortunate enough to find himself actually in the dock and placed in peril on this antique charge. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure we are all, as lawyers, from time to time guilty of seeking to flatter juries. But when it comes to my learned friend, Mr. Spy, that is, of course, laid on with charm. You have been told, and I've no doubt it made you feel perhaps at first extremely honoured, but when you came to think about it, perhaps a little put off, that you were now standing as a jury at a crisis of history. And you were going to come to some historic decision which was going to set everybody's standards. And if Mr. Lemon was satisfactorily convicted, the church bells would ring, the members of the Festival of Light would be dancing in the streets, and bonfires would be lit from here to Smithfield. Ladies and gentlemen, we all have our standards, do we not? I hope, and we all hope, that we have high standards. We don't need decisions in criminal courts down in the Old Bailey to tell us what our standards are going to be. You are not a kind of board of censors who are going to tell us what we ought to think or what we ought to say. You're here for a much more important reason than that. You are here for the most vital function a human being can perform. You are judging the guilt or innocence of a fellow creature and that is all you are here to decide. How are you going to approach your task? You're going to approach it as every jury must, I'm sure, in trying any criminal case, whether it is a case of murder, or a case of illegal parking on a double yellow line, or even a case of blasphemy. You will not convict Gay News or Mr. Dennis Lemon of anything whatsoever, unless and until you are absolutely sure and satisfied that the only possible answer is that they must be guilty. The burden of proof is on the prosecution in every criminal case, but it must be more importantly so, if that could be, in a case where the prosecution are seeking to limit our great constitutional right to free speech. The burden must be on those who are trying to prove us guilty. It must also be very heavy on those who are seeking to restrict our freedom. For this is a country which has fought, bled, and died over the centuries for the right to say, print, and read what it likes. To have controversy, to argue, to discuss. My learned friend in opening this case said it must be decent controversy. Do we accept that? Must we have all our controversy limited to what would be acceptable conversation on the vicarage lawn? Or is there a right to express ourselves strongly? Express ourselves in forcible language. Express ourselves in rude language, if we like, about the things we feel most dearly about. Politics, Christianity, freedom, religion. And this principle of burden of proof applies, does it not, when you have to consider various interpretations of the poem. It's not just a question of picking one honest argument. Human beings are not convicted in this court as a result of who wins the television debate. 
You don't press the buzzer at the end of the discussion on the epilogue and say, I quite agree, God got the best of the argument, get convicted and go down to the cells. I know you will not deal with it in that way, for that would be to deal with it like Pontius Pilate, who washed his hands and refused to think about another crucial legal matter. We then come to the poem itself. To Mr. Smythe, speaking on behalf of the prosecution, the poem is worthless. A mere piece of rudery, a gay squib which cocks a snook of Christianity, impertinent and of no value. It might, of course, be all those things, but that would not make it blasphemy until the prosecution had proved that it has a tendency to breach the peace. The title of the poem, as you will all remember, is The Love That Dares to Speak Its Name. Those of you, ladies and gentlemen, who read will, I'm sure, know and remember what that title refers to. Some 25 years before the last blasphemy case was heard in this court, some 80 years ago now, one of our greatest playwrights and poets, the author of one of the most delightful comedies to grace our language, was standing his trial in this building, and the law was administering society's cruelest hostility towards homosexuals. And Oscar Wilde, was sentenced to two years hard labor. His health was broken and his career was at an end. Not for blasphemy. Quite so, my lord, not for blasphemy. For homosexuality. The judge, I think, at the end of that case, the judge who had tried murderers and rapists, said it was the worst case he had ever tried in his life. And as you will remember, the prostitutes danced in the street. That was the trial of Oscar Wilde, something, I suppose, which could not happen in our tolerant, I would say, far more decent society. On his way to that particular Calvary, Oscar Wilde, that great writer, spoke from the witness box in this building. He spoke of the love that dare not speak its name. The love is said of David for Jonathan, the love of Plato for his disciples the love that is spoken of in Shakespeare's sonnets and the sonnets of Michelangelo, the love which a prostitution such as this might, for all I know, say is no love at all. This poem speaks of a love that dares to speak its name. Dares to. Perhaps do you think because our society has become less cruel and more understanding. Dares to, says the poem. Because the love of Christ for mankind is everywhere, even among those who were once thought of as criminals and social outcasts. Homosexual love in Wilde's time was secret, ashamed and afraid of the law. But now, it can be spoken of openly, I suppose, in the face of God and man. Mr. Smythe has referred you to various passages in the Bible, and I quote only one sentence from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. <clears throat> and whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. That is perhaps how the true Christian will react, not with violence and with breach of the peace to any controversial matter about his religion. However, members of the jury, such huge conceptions are not what you are here to try. Basically, they narrowed down to one man sitting in the dock, Mr. Dennis Lemon, with the dock officer at his side and the great antique machinery of the law trundled out against him. The question is, are you sure he is guilty? If there are two views of the matter, after you have heard all that has been said to you in this court, if there are two possible opinions, then you cannot be sure. And if you are not sure, it will be your duty, it may be your pleasure. It may be the conclusion most consonant with the religion which this prosecution strives to defend, to bring in a verdict of not guilty against this editor, Mr. Lemon. Ladies and gentlemen, before I explain to you the law about blasphemy, there are some general observations which I think it proper that I should make. 
My functions are twofold. I have to direct you about the law, and I have to sum up the evidence. I have no doubt whatever about the law, but if I make a mistake and give you a wrong direction, and there happens to be a conviction in consequence of that wrong direction, there is a court of appeal to put the matter right. No one could blame you, and it is only the judge who would have been at fault. It has been suggested that this is an antique law. Well, no doubt it is antique, but so are the offences of murder and theft. But I have to tell you, it is still the law, and you must not allow your opinions of the law to dissuade you from following my directions about it. If it is a bad law, it is for Parliament to change it. In the light of my directions about the law, you have to come to a conclusion about this poem. And when I come to deal with the poem, you may find that from time to time I express my own views about it, which I am entitled to do if I think my opinion could be of some assistance to you. If it transpires, however, that you do not agree with any opinion I am expressing, then you are not only entitled to ignore my opinion, but you are bound to do so. What we want at the end of the case is a reflection of your opinion, not mine. When, ladies and gentlemen, you are considering this poem, you must try to recapture in your minds the impact it made upon you when you first read it. Does it offend? Well, look at the poem, in particular, from lines 19 to line 24, inclusive. Incidentally, lines 19 to 24, inclusive, were not referred to by Mr. Robertson in what if I might so describe it, was a most eloquent speech. Indeed, I thought the speeches of all three counsel were of a very high order, all of them. But look at those lines, ladies and gentlemen. Just look at them. No, I do not intend to read them aloud. Are you surprised that Mr. Robertson did not refer to those when he made various quotations from the poem? Can you imagine anything more profane? Do you think God would like to be recognized in a context of a poem such as this? There can be no doubt at all what the poem says. It says, never mind the symbolism for the moment, I will deal with that later, in actual terms that not only was Christ a homosexual but promiscuous. Not content with that, the poem goes on to describe an act of buggery by Christ when dying, or by some miracle after his death. It is entirely a matter for you. But I suggest you must ask yourselves whether there could really be anything more profane. The paper itself is not on trial. If the poem is a blasphemous libel, which it is for you to decide, it would still be a blasphemous libel even if it were published in the Times, the Church Times or the Catholic Herald. Uh, Mr. Robertson, or the company, put forward a possible interpretation of the poem. You will, of course, give to it such consideration as you think that interpretation merits. But the point is, how would an ordinary Christian or sympathizer with Christianity interpret it? Mr. Mortimer asked the rhetorical question, do we have the right to express ourselves strongly and rudely if we like? Well, as he posed the question, I will answer it. Yes, we do have that right. But if we choose in the exercise of that right so to express ourselves in something which is published as to run the risk of offending, provoking people, arousing their anger and resentment, as could, not would, could lead to a breach of the peace, then we must take the risk of being prosecuted. That is the law. Also, he said, it is a private prosecution against the Christian religion. In fact, members of the jury, you may think it is not a prosecution against the Christian religion, but rather it is, of course, a matter for you, a prosecution to protect the Christian religion. It cannot be denied, of course, that we have been living in a permissive age. There are some who may think that permissiveness has gone far enough. There are others who may think that there should be no limit whatever to what may be published. 
Well, if they are right, one may wonder what scurrilous profanity may next appear. But the prosecution members of the jury is not an attempt to crush free opinion. A person may think what he likes. If there is any disturbance in the gallery, I will have it cleared. I repeat, members of the jury, this prosecution is not an attempt to crush free opinion. But if a person says or writes what is injurious to others, then his actions are liable to be controlled by the law. Please now retire, taking with you all your copies of documents, consider your verdict, and in due course tell me how you find. This way, members of the jury. Uh, there was a moment when, the, after the judge's uh, final summing up, I thought the jury possibly would be back in about 20 minutes or something. But once an hour and two hours passed, then I began thinking that uh, it may not be the result which my counsel thought it may well be. Almost five hours they'd been out of court. And we were walking along the passages of the Old Bailey. And a very young American girl who was with us suddenly stopped and she said, you know, I have a, a sense that we should stop now at this moment and just pray together for the jury. And because we wanted one another to hear what we were saying, we prayed loud enough for us to hear one another. Uh, and we just prayed with all the heart we had, I know, that the Holy Spirit would go into that jury room and guide aright whoever it was that was holding it up, because it was quite clear at this stage that one or perhaps two, but we had a sense it was one person. We all felt it was one person. That the Lord would really enter into the heart of that person and give them what was true. It was only after five hours of deliberation and two directions from the judge that the jury reached a verdict of guilty by a majority of ten to two. The reaction of some members of the homosexual community was instant. A month and a half ago in Chelsea, this demonstration was held against the verdict and against the law. In the minds of many homosexuals, the trial for blasphemy was another episode in the story of their repression. But the issue the trial raises would remain if the poem had never mentioned homosexuality. Do we still hold there are some beliefs so sacred that they must be respected, even at the cost of limiting our freedom of speech? For the moment, this issue is expressed and obscured by these particular violent hatreds. Well, if you're asking me if I have any bitterness or hatred or resentment against Dennis Lemon for, for uh, publishing this poem, I don't have those feelings towards him. Why That's not? not... Well, I don't. He, what he does is really what he must settle in his conscience. Now, if in publishing that, he gives great offence to Christian feeling in such a way that the blasphemy law moves in and says this is illegal, then he must contend with the law. But it's not a battle, as some of the newspapers and some of the comments have, have tried to make it out be between me and Dennis Lemon or me and the homosexuals. This is a nonsense. I think she saw this as a valuable campaign to get a lot of publicity for her cause. People are always like talking about lines and frontiers and how far we go. I really think that that's really we miss the issues by talking about these these frontiers and the rest of it. Why do you think she behaves in this way? I think she's a little worried in this, about the changes we have in our society. Such changes 
basically, which I think are for the, for the better. I think Mary Whitehouse would like to see the religion, her religion, to be a much stronger force in our society. But I worry a little bit about whether that minority should have that amount of influence. I did what I did, starting that case, out of love of the Lord. It seemed to me, anyway, that if the case was lost, that I would have to accept that God was letting it be lost. And I began to wonder whether, if the case was lost, what he wasn't going to let this society do, as other nations through history have had to do, is come face to face with what, where their compromise and their misdoings have really landed their nation. And maybe we would have a very great price to pay. I would have a price to pay. Maybe the whole nation would have a price to pay. And maybe it was only when we paid the price that we would be brought face to face with where if you like, the softness of the church, the compromise of people, the willingness of, of, of people to make money out, out of the, the, the essence of what it is to be human as well as divine, has landed at all. Although I sometimes read poetry, and as a rule I like what I read, I do not profess to be a judge of it and therefore would not presume to express an opinion as to whether this particular poem is a good one, or a bad one, or an indifferent one. But I have no doubt whatever, and apparently ten of the jury agree with me, that this poem is quite appalling, and that it contains the most scurrilous profanity, and I hope never to see the like of it again. It is past comprehension how an intelligent, and obviously from what I have just heard, highly qualified and educated man can come to express in those words a conversion to Christ. If so be, the poem means that. As for its publication, at the lowest it reveals an astonishing and lamentable bad taste and error of judgment, and at the highest it shows a reckless disregard for the feelings of Christians, whether practicing or non-practicing and for millions, I would suggest, of non-Christians, but who nevertheless sympathize with Christianity. Lemon, it has been in my view, since you are not only a director, but the editor of Gay News Limited, touch and go whether or not you should serve an immediate custodial sentence. But I have decided that that would not be right, and it will suffice to meet the public conscience if I pass upon you a suspended sentence as part of the penalty you have to pay. There will be nine months imprisonment suspended for a period of 18 months. Furthermore, you will pay a fine of 500 pounds and you will pay one-fifth of the tax costs of the prosecution. The company will be fined 1,000 pounds and I direct that they pay four-fifths of the tax costs of the prosecution. <laughs>